Hello everyone, I'm Captain Logan. Welcome to the Late to the Party, but also much overstayed, it's welcome, Comic Vault. Today, we're gonna take a look, finally, at the first arc of Smallville Season 11. It's been a lot of years since this first came out and since its ending or cancellation, but I am finally gonna chat about it for a couple of reasons. I am actually being made to watch this. You or read this. You made me read this. This is a request from Ian McKee, who is uh, one of our patrons and has had me read a lot of comics, and this is a series he's uh, been wanting me to, to uh, read and talk about for a while. I initially declined that request, asked him to pick something else because I was in the middle of doing Counting Crypto Freaks and I had planned and eventually to get to this after all of the commentaries on the Smallville episodes. And I decided recently to stop those commentaries because there wasn't quite enough interest and because people have been asking for season overviews, which I am hoping to finally get to soon, and I'm streamlining the channel down to just three to four videos a week. So I decided to go ahead and uh, take Ian up on his request and start talking about the season 11. 11 comics and jumping all the way to season 11. Now, I don't have the uh, recent seasons right before this fresh in my mind, so it has been as many years since it was on the air that I have seen season 10 and seen the finale of that show. I remember certain things about that finale vividly because it made me angry, and that made it very difficult to enjoy this first issue when it first came out. So I tried this uh, shortly after it came out, was very unimpressed with the first issue, didn't like it, was really upset with where we were stuck with Lex, didn't think there was anything cool you could do with with that. Uh, I, was, I was thinking that this being written by one of the guys that did that season, it was just going to be more of the same, a lot of sanctimonious platitudes and a bunch of people talking talking about amorphous ideas and feelings instead of actually uh, a real story happening that's not being pushed forward just by people talking about, again, their, their feelings and just basic notions of love and destiny and sappy nonsense. And uh, then I finally, um, a few months ago, read the first couple arcs of this. So I've actually read beyond this uh, before, earlier last year. And I uh, was surprisingly enjoying it and giving it a shot after that first issue, realized that there was maybe a little bit more to this than I initially gave it credit for, that there was maybe a tongue-in-cheek quality that I wasn't picking up on in the first place, and that maybe uh, this guy was uh, had more of a sense of what he was working on in Smallville and how not great that show had gotten than uh, he was initially letting on in that first issue. This is written by Brian Q. Miller, and like I said, he's on the writing staff for at least the last couple seasons. If not more, I don't remember now. He wasn't the showrunner, but he was one of the writers on that show with art by Pere Perez, or Pere Perez, not sure how to pronounce his first name. Uh, so this first arc is just four issues, four normal sized issues. This was originally printed digital first, so it's in that format, and I don't know if comics are doing this at all right now, because I'm not reading any new digital comics at the moment, but we had um, at least uh, when the digital thing started and was beginning to get popular, uh, we would do these digital first books where you basically would get what looked like half a page instead of a full page, and when it was printed later in the normal format, uh, two pages would be put back together as one, and it was seamless and you couldn't tell the difference. Uh, but if you read this in digital, and that's how I did it this time, uh, it just read kind of half a page at a time, and or maybe a, a th like two-thirds of a page, I'm not sure. Uh, and then... Um, you put all that together and you get a 22-page comic book. So the uh, the way that this reads, if you just read it in digital, uh, each issue is only a few pages and it takes three to make one full-sized regular 22-page, 23-page comic book. So, uh, or, or I should I should say 21, 22-page comic book. So uh, this is 12 issues in digital, this first trade. It is only... Uh, four issues, or is it 
um, what, what, what did I say earlier? It's, it's three digital issues to make one full issue, because three times four is twelve. So, so uh, you, it's twelve issues if you... It's late at night, I forget what I said. It's, tw it's twelve issues if you read it in digital. It's four regular size issues if you just read the trade or you read it in the single issues. Anyways, that's how this works. So the first arc is called Guardian. Uh, after this, we get to the Smallville version of Batman. Uh, makes a lot of sense that they wanted to jump into that as soon as possible. Um, maybe not open with it uh, because there's aftermath to do from the... And I'm glad we didn't open with it because there's aftermath to do from the end of the series. Uh, this plays like a true season 11, even though, of course, there wouldn't have been more TV show because you wouldn't end that show the way we ended it if there was going to be more. First of all, you couldn't get Rosenbaum to keep uh, coming back and uh, make a new contract and stay on the show, so you wouldn't have Lex there, uh, for starters. But it plays like only a couple, three months have passed, if that, and it, you know, watches very much like it's the very next season of that show, and so um, you've got to deal with what the new status quo is with Superman, how Clark is uh, dealing with his newfound fame and popularity as Superman, uh, how is he using his new um, iconic status for good, but also uh, be it being the first few months of Superman, how difficult is it for him to uh, wield that power without giving off the wrong impression, and what kind of mistakes is he, is he making, all those kinds of Pardon me, all those kinds of things. And so uh, you wouldn't want to mix that up with Batman right away, especially because you have to uh, establish, and this is what it irritated me initially, um, the new Lex and Clark and then Lex and Superman dynamic, since you have now a Smallville Lex who has lost and had, had his memory taken away from him the entire 10 years of that show, uh, the, the seven years that he was actually on, of course, and uh, where he no longer remembers all of the character development, character progression that he went to to lead him on the path of being evil. Now he's just evil because I guess that was destiny, even though there was a whole argument in the show about free will versus destiny, and there was always a question about that and whether he could fight his nature and what his true nature really was. Uh, is it the way he's raised by his father, or does he have a choice to follow Clark and Clark's parents' example, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I've talked about all I've talked about all of this ad nauseum, and we just wipe all of that away, and now we just have kind of a blank slate lax. Uh, and this uh, certainly makes it more interesting than I would have thought it could have been. And I'll talk about that. But anyway, so those are all reasons that uh, it's a good thing that we didn't do Batman right up front. But, of course, uh, it makes a lot of sense that you would want to get to him right away because the uh, creators and then uh, other writers and producers on the show always wanted to get to Bruce Wayne. We're never allowed to do that because of the Nolan Batman movies. And so we never got there in 10 years. And uh, in the very next arc, we'll get to see some Batman, so we'll talk about that. Uh, but Guardian is uh, an arc that I thought would have brought in the DC character Guardian, uh, who is around during the death of Superman, reign of the Superman era, but that is not what happens. However, we do bring in a character from that stuff who is Hank Henshaw, and we see the Smallville version of Cyborg Superman, one of the very few major Superman villains that you've heard of that was never handled in, uh, in, in the Smallville um, spirit and aesthetic, uh, never um, adapted for that series. And so we do it here in, again, kind of a tongue-in-cheek way, uh, sort of the way you might expect Smallville to do it, uh, but with a character who is a little bit more um, believable and a little bit more sympathetic than Smallville might have made him. Mileage varies with villains and Crypt the Freaks in that show, of course, uh, but the, the, the version that Miller does here, uh, I suspect would not have been what that show would have done, at least as far as making me uh, kind of uh, appreciate and at or at least kind of feel bad for him by the end of the way I do. However, the way it handles the way he becomes Cyborg Superman is actually is absolutely what that show would do. And from memory, what I remember reading the first two or three arcs of this is that it walks this really interesting balance of being a little bit more 
uh, tight in its narrative, a little smarter in its storytelling, uh, a little bit more, it, it has a little bit more fun with a lot of things and makes its characters generally more drawn and with more dimension than it would have in that show. But it also will sometimes do things that are really silly because it's Smallville, intentionally stupid and sometimes even intentionally lame. And somehow there's sometimes a cleverness to the brand of lameness because you go, that's dumb. And then you go, oh, wait, it's Smallville. So now it feels authentic. And it kind of should have some of that. And because I'm enjoying the character stuff a little bit more and I'm not rolling my eyes quite as much at that, I'm not only... Uh, willing to give it some of the stupid stuff, but I'm also kind of reveling a little bit in the stupid stuff. This doesn't have that nearly as much as the next arc is going to. Uh, I remember there being a thing, and this plays into an issue I have with this uh, that I'll talk about here in a little bit, but I remember there being something, we'll see if I'm right about this and if we hit it when, when I get to the next arc, about Clark used to run faster and now for some reason he doesn't there's like some really goofy explanation as to why he he can't run and fly as fast as he used to so like we've gotten rid of bullet time for some reason he's like limited now in some way and i think it had something to do with his development like now that he's fully developed he's actually slower than he used to be but i can't remember what exactly that is but there's a scene here where he, and this is uh, the crux of the, the, the Henshaw plot, this is uh, the origin of Cyborg Superman, uh, which is reminiscent of what it is in the comics, where Hank Henshaw is an astronaut, he goes up into space, and uh, he's, he's uh, kind of this, you know, big astronaut hero, and he's paralleled in this to Superman in the first place. Uh, we, we, uh, we have a, a Superman-esque hero already who doesn't have superpowers, he just puts his life on the line um, for the sake of the betterment of mankind, and he goes on these, you know, dangerous space, space missions. And... Superman tries to save Hank Henshaw when things go wrong. Uh, it will turn out that Lex is partly, if not entirely, responsible for what goes wrong because of uh, grander ambitions, personal ambitions of his own, as always. And uh, Superman can't get there in time. And the big question is, how does he not fly fast enough to get there? And Hank and his wife are both going to blame him for not getting there fast enough. It's going to be kind of that Nero Spock thing from Star Trek 09. Oh, you tried to save us, and we now blame you for the entire thing because you didn't get there in time. It's a little bit more understandable here, believe it or not, than it is in Star Trek 09. Uh, because Superman is being touted up as being... Uh, this almost perfect savior that can do no wrong, and uh, he just hasn't had any foibles yet. He hasn't been doing this long enough, and people are starting to unrealistically think that he can handle anything and can save everyone, and uh, when he doesn't save Henshaw, um, who I uh, kind of like like wanted to believe in him but wasn't you know totally sure, and then he's vindicated in. Uh, in, in not fully trusting that this guy is, you know, the genuine article or that he might be too good to be true, uh, now he hates him for it. And uh, I'm thinking, how in the world did he not get there fast enough? And there, there's a goofy explanation, again, I believe in the next arc for that, and not here. Uh, there is question about that. People are the people who know Clark um, are, are kind of wondering how he didn't get there fast enough. Uh, but anyway, we, we, get a, we get a weird explanation about it afterwards. Um, like I said, the first time I read this, I did not like that first issue, and a lot of it was because of my irritation with that finale and where we were stuck with, with Lex. Um, let me tell you what I like about it now, especially after, after having read this whole arc and looking Looking at it again, um, Lex is is uh, talked about as being kind of the original Lex, but more of this new person who's been put back together from various clones. And so uh, the idea, so there's this identity question of is he even really the same Lex that we knew from before? And I think that kind of covers a multitude of sins and uh, it kind of fixes some of that, uh, well, we just, you know, ruined this character and turned him into this one-dimensional character uh, problem I had before, especially because now we're starting to kind of build him back up again. Uh, it's almost the reverse of what it was before, where you have this guy who is uh, trying his darndest to do the right thing, 
but his upbringing uh, and, you know, his father's influence and just the, the power that he's able to wield keeps getting the better of him. So even though he keeps trying to go down the right path, he ends up um, winding up on the other side because of certainly choices he's making and he's always conscious of it uh, and, he, and, and he continues to kind of hate himself for it until he gets to the point where he's just accepted this is who I am now, where he basically comes out and says, um, I am the bad guy. And in this, it's like the reverse, where he starts from that mustache twirly place, and then Superman, uh, toward the end of this arc, starts to see potentially some good in him. You know, maybe your heart's actually in the right place. Maybe you're trying to do the right thing. And yes, Clark is naive about it, and yes, Clark still remembers, because he didn't have his whole mind wiped, uh, the good old days where Lex... Um, was somewhat more morally ambiguous, but there was good in him, and he was trying. And he starts to see that in him again uh, when he tries to save Hank Henshaw. And he does that, he has ulterior motives for that, and then, in, and I'll talk about that in a minute, because his ulterior motives have to do with uh, Tess Mercer, whose consciousness is now stuck in his head and he's trying to get that out, which is a very Smallville thing to do. Um, of course, it found a way to bring Tess back from the dead. Uh, and, like, I'm just imagining how this would play on screen. Like, of, of course we did that. It's like, oh, we like this actress, we don't want to lose her. Uh, we got to contrive some way to keep, to keep her around. Sort of like, uh, you know, bringing back... Um, Lionel Luther through a, a really obvious mirror universe ploy and uh, occasionally having Jonathan Kent come back as a ghost and stuff like that. Uh, this is handled better than that, and I'll talk about it in a second, but um, he he does have ulterior motives for everything he's doing here. And again, pretty tight narrative where uh, Lex is sort of like Lionel was a lot behind a lot of... Uh, the bad things that are going on in this and like different things that at first you might think are unrelated uh, that turn out to be part of uh, a, a I don't even want to say a grand plot from Lex like he is very um, opportunistic and he just uh, kind of uh, is making up stuff as he goes, and he, he did this in the series too, uh, where he's very plotty and schemy, and he's manipulative, and he's really good at making it look like he's doing things for the greater good, when in fact uh, he's got everybody round, wound around his finger. But at the same time, there is a little bit of that question of maybe he still has some compassion, maybe there is some of that old Lex there, and... It is very telling when you get to the end of, of this uh, arc, and despite everything, despite uh, there being an earlier scene where Superman uh, busts in and impulsively breaks Lex's window and uh, loses it and almost, um, you know, attacks him, uh, despite all of that, when he thinks that maybe there's some good in Lex, he comes back and he tries to shake his hand, and Lex won't shake his hand. And so that's very telling about where Lex is right now. And yet, there's that potential spark uh, that maybe there's still a little bit of good in him. And I don't know where all of this goes, because I have not read all of this uh, ahead of time. And I'm kind of excited to, um, to you know, learn as I go and find out if uh, they ever get close at all to becoming friends again. This being uh, comics and, you know, no pressure of going back to screen or dealing with any other spinoff canon, because that didn't happen. I, Arrow had started at this point. This can kind of go anywhere, uh, which is kind of what's fun about reading a thing like this. It ends up being like an Elseworlds thing uh, where it's an alternate uh, continuity. And, like, it is Smallville, which was a continuity that we were really interested in, uh, but now it's also an alternate Superman. And so if you're reading other Superman comics or you're reading other DC stuff, uh, this can go anywhere it wants to, and it doesn't have to worry about what characters... There's not any embargoes on anything. Like, it can use anybody it wants to, for, for the most part, I imagine, and it can kind of go any place it wants to. And so maybe this Clark... And nobody tell me in the comments, please, but, like, maybe, maybe this uh, Superman and Lex become friends. Maybe there's almost... Or, or, or close to friends. Maybe there's almost like a triangle where Lex and Clark don't get along, but Lex and Superman do, that sort of thing, because now we have a Lex that doesn't know that, that uh, you know, Clark has powers. Clark and Superman are the same person, and uh, we have the, the classic, you know, uh, he looks at these as different people thing. 
Um, so I'm curious to see where that goes. I think uh, Miller uh, sometimes writes a really good, authentic Rosenbaum Lex, and sometimes he's a little off the mark. Uh, I think the writing in this is hit or miss, just like it was with that show. I, in some ways, this feels almost review-proof. Uh, there are... There are places where I'm like, okay, I don't like this, but it's probably what Smallville would have done. I don't want to make excuses for, or make that excuse for it with everything, though. It is a little bit inconsistent about its writing in places. There are places where it will do... It, 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 will, it will do things that feel too cute to me, and I'm like, did it do that because Smallville did it, or did, or did it do that because Miller thought that, that was cool? It's hard to say in, in certain places, so I don't want to give it a complete pass for that, uh, it, but, you know, I, I guess, again, I guess mileage varies. I guess it just depends on who you are and what your sensibilities are and, you know, what... Um, you know, whether some of that kind of cute writing speaks to you or not. Uh, and what I mainly mean is uh, that kind of classic, like, Smallville classic now. This show's almost 20 years old. Um, this, which is nuts. This classic, like, uh, Smallville, you know, uh, obvious foreshadowing Superman things. Even though he is Superman now, we're still doing that. And, and, and uh, references to, uh, you know, different Superman lore and stuff. So places where I kind of roll my eyes and other places where I go, I can't roll my eyes, but it's what Smallville would do. So, of course, this is here. But places where uh, I don't find it as... Um, fun and endearing, if that's the right word, is or, or at least authentic, you know, to to the to this material, is uh, when characters are speaking a little bit out of character. Uh, and Miller has that with Lex in places. There's one bit where, when again that scene I mentioned earlier, where Superman is in his office after he is clearly responsible for uh, the injuries to Hank Henshaw. And he uh, breaks the glass of the window and is uh, is about to lose it on Lex. Uh, classic Superman scene. We've seen this lots of times. Uh, this goes back to a lot, by the way, of Christopher Reeve stuff. And uh, we we have a we have a very Christopher Reeve Superman here, and that's where we should go with it because that is the Superman that it wanted to get to. Uh, with all the references to that in the series, with doing um, that version in a lot of places anyway, of Kryptonian stuff, using that music, using a lot of that iconography in places. Uh, we got the crypto, the, the, the uh, uh, Krypton hula hoops and all of that. And of course you had uh, Christopher Reeve himself in the series. Uh, that is the Superman that you would want to get to. I question whether that guy could have ever gotten there, of course, um, but he sort of is that here with Tom Welling's face. Anyway, so uh, you got that scene where he's in Lex's office, and uh, he goes, give me one reason uh, why I should, whatever it, it, it is he says, and uh, Lex goes, um, I'll give you three, and then there's, um, and, th and then there's, uh, you know, three helicopters right outside, and uh, the military comes after Superman. But he, but what he, what he actually says, he, he doesn't say, let me give you three, he says, how's about I give you three? Mm -mm, mm -mm. Uh, Rosenbaum Lex not gonna see, even if you can make the argument that he's not quite the Lex we know, uh, he's trying to write that Lex's dialogue most of the time. He's trying to write that, you know, really ultra confident, narcissistic, witty, clever, always the smartest man in the, in, in the room, Lex. He's, that Lex does not say how's about. Uh, so, you know, there's there's bits like that. Uh, that might sound kind of nitpicky, but it, it jumped out at me. That's that's not, that's not a thing Lex would say. There's a few of those kind of things in this. But anyway, so uh, the Tess Mercer thing, Lex, uh, in the finale of Smallville, uh, murders Tess, and uh, in this, everybody thinks that she has committed suicide, and uh, she starts showing up to him like a hallucination. Uh, by the way, that just reminds me, and I, I wanted to mention this somewhere, that uh, there are some really strange like language mistakes and typos in this. Like, it just wasn't looked over and revised enough, uh, almost like it didn't have an editor. Uh, it's a little 
uh, it feels a little rushed out, and uh, there are um, there are places where there are words missing and stuff. And one thing I noticed was, again, this is this is kind of nitpicky, but it's just it, it's just a weird, inconsistent thing. Uh, Lex, you know, uh, hallucination. That word comes up several times in the dialogue, and the first time Lex says it, he says a hallucination, and the next two times he says it, it's an hallucination, which is grammatically correct. And this is weird that Lex would be Lex is so particular about the way he speaks. It's weird that he would that he would say it that way, which makes me think it was a mistake. Uh, maybe it's not a mistake, but it certainly read that way. And there's, there, like I said, there's, there's weird grammatical errors in this. But anyway, so she is in hallucination, or is she? And again, it turns out that it's uh, more that, like, uh, Peter Parker, when Doc Ock is in his body thing, uh, I remember from Superior Spider-Man, if you've read that, uh, where Doc Ock has taken over Peter Parker's body, but Peter Parker's consciousness is still in there somewhere. And that's kind of what we have here, except Lex is still in charge. Uh, she's never able to take over his body. But it turns out that, there, that there's this wacky side effect Again, a very small little thing to do. Um, they, they, don't, they don't give you even pseudoscience. They just go, something, something, this happened. Apparently, when Lex got the serum that made him lose his memories, it also made Tess's consciousness go in his head. She, so she is still alive within him, and he's trying to figure out how to get her out. And this is all tied back, way back, to uh, Season 3 Smallville, with uh, kind of where I left off when I was doing the commentaries, and uh, where uh, Lex was given a drug to make him uh, lose his memories, and then when that didn't work, uh, Lionel gave him shock therapy. And the drug that, and I don't remember if this is in the finale or if this makes this up, but apparently the idea is supposed to be, and this is technically canon, uh, and it's like, like uh, it, it ought to be so far. Um, it doesn't seem to be like retconning anything major or uh, like like uh, like like going against anything. It has a really good sense of continuity, and it ought to, because the guy that's writing this worked on this show. And it's got some really nice uh, throwbacks to stuff from that show and references to things. Um, so apparently, uh, again, this is derived from the the drug from Summerhold, and I don't remember if that was in that finale or not. Uh, and it says, it claims that uh, when that was first used uh, back at Summerholt, this happened to somebody else, where there was somebody whose uh, consciousness got infused onto somebody else's consciousness. And now that has happened with uh, Tess and Lex. And I'm curious to see where that goes and if we do anything cool with it. Um, but it is neat to see them together, finally, uh, for any amount of time. I mean, I guess they're there in, in the finale, uh, but Tess was kind of a replacement Lex, and you have, when, when he left, uh, of course, uh, originally based on, uh, his right-hand man of the comics from No Man's Land on, uh, t uh, Tess Mercer, and then, of course, she ends up, and all, lots of spoilers for, from Smallville, but if you're here, you probably know that show, uh, well enough to care about this. But I, uh, of course, like so many characters, Tess Mercer turns out to be uh, yet another, I think, Ill illegitimate uh, child of Lionel Luther's, and Lex and she are sisters, or excuse me, brother and sister, and uh, they never really knew each other, and now... Uh, they have this weird quality time together inside of Lex's head, uh, of Lex's head, and uh, that tete a tete is kind of fun to read, and I'm caring about that a lot more than I expected that I would. Um, I mentioned that uh, Hank Henshaw actually turns into Cyborg Superman in this, so this reads, by the way, sort of like one single episode. Although so much happens, it would have to on television be at least a two or three parter. But it is a story with a beginning, middle, end, and end that sets up stuff for the ongoing grander narrative. There's this whole subplot about Crisis on Infinite Earths eventually coming, uh, which is really kind of kind of odd and surreal to read uh, now, right after the Arrow Crisis. And uh, so there's a uh, Chloe from Earth 2 that shows up and at the end of this reveals that Earth 2 is gone. And uh, so that's um, so, so that's a plot thread that we're beginning. Uh, but the Hank Henshaw story uh, is, is beginning middle to end. He's kind of our uh, villain, our 
crypto freak. He's not a, he's not actually a crypto freak, but he's our villain uh, for this arc. And I would have expected that he just gets established, you know, kind of like Harvey Dent might in something, and then eventually become Two Face. Uh, that he would eventually become. Kind of like in Batman the Animated Series, where Hank Henshaw would just eventually become Cyborg Superman. But of course, we do it on his first outing, because that's what Smallville would do. And uh, it's less silly than the way it's handled in the Supergirl TV show, because there, uh, Hank Henshaw says he's Cyborg Superman, and there's not any iconography on him whatsoever that has anything to do with Superman. And he doesn't look like Superman, he's not wearing a Superman costume, there's no reason he would call himself Cyborg Superman. In this, there's some kind of fun setup for it, where, uh, like, the, the, first of all, there's some foreshadowing, there's some foreshadowing, excuse me, where Lex... Uh, early on says, we have our own Superman, and then you turn the page and the big reveal is, oh, it's it's Hank Henshaw. Oh, ha, 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 he's going to become Cyborg Superman. That's foreshadowing I actually kind of like. And then uh, when he becomes a cyborg, he's actually not a cyborg so much as a full-on robot with a human consciousness in him, which is, by the way, an interesting parallel to Lex, because Lex is a uh, organic life form created... Uh, by hobbling together pieces of clones to make a new clone that is uh, really close to the original Lex Luthor, uh, whereas this is a fully robotic guy that has the consciousness of a real person put in him. I don't know if that's an intentional character parallel thing, but it's kind of it's kind of an interesting thing that I that I notice. It's not drawn out um, to to the uh, to the fore or anything. But uh, so he's not a cyborg so much as a straight up. Uh, robot. He's like even more robotic than Metallo, who is like a straight up cyborg guy. Uh, but he, th this guy's more like Robocop, but even less human than Robocop. Uh, and he can't feel or anything. And uh, so immediately it's like this total horror s show for him uh, because he's like, well, you know, Lex basically wants him to grovel at his feet for saving him when the only reason Lex is really doing this, by the way, is so that he can try to come up with... He's using Hank Henshaw as a guinea pig to test out this consciousness-moving technology so that he can try to get Tess Mercer's uh, uh, consciousness out of his body and into one of these robots. Uh, not that he wants her to live out a life with that. Uh, he, he, he basically says that he's going to, like, stick her in a room somewhere and then eventually kill her, but he but but this, this is a way to get her out. And... Anyway, so um, Hank Henshaw is in a robot body that I uh, has... I'm not sure why they talk about it like it has something to do with Superman. Like, it, I don't know if it's supposed to have his powers. He doesn't use all of Superman's powers. I don't really know what the connection is to Superman, but uh, just in order for us to be able to call him Cyborg Superman, that's brought up. But again, seems like the, a thing Smallville would do. And then it has the Superman crest on the front of the costume, but not an S or anything. Uh, so he is as loosely as humanly possible Cyborg Superman, but still more Cyborg Superman than the Hank Henshaw from Superman, where that is just 18 shades of ridiculous, and this is like maybe three shades of ridiculous. And so uh, Superman uh, reluctantly fights him. He feels he feels really bad about this whole thing. Um, he kind of blames himself a little bit, although he's not whiny about it at all. Uh, this is not Smallville whiny Clark, really. His face is sometimes drawn like he should be saying whiny dialogue because uh, he looks like Tom Welling, but he's but, but he's not doing that. And he, and he looks specifically like he's giving facial expressions that Tom Welling gave in that show. Uh, but he's but he's not he's not doing that. He's he's wonderfully sympathetic and he does seem to be learning and growing we'll see if he you know hangs on to anything he's learned and and uh if like in the tv show he keeps getting regressed um but right now i'm, I'm pretty well with him uh and kind of feel for him with this whole thing uh he's got that very christopher reeve like i can't save everyone thing and he's trying but he's failing and yet he still continues on trying and says okay like i'm starting to accept that i can't save everyone but that doesn't mean that i'm not going to continue to try and the big thing he's learning is uh, that he has, you know, this massive responsibility with all these powers while he's trying to set the example to uh, not, like, he has to be as perfect as he can be. I mean, he's, he's learning how to go from Clark to Superman, and he's saying, uh, oh, okay, uh, I can't 
I don't have the luxury of going off half cocked like I almost did with Lex up in uh, his office building because uh, as soon as that happens and the military starts putting two and two together and realizes that he's been at uh, so many like uh, scenes of, tr of 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 catastrophe, uh, maybe they can't trust him. Maybe he's been uh, you know creating ruses and doing this on purpose to get people to 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 uh, bl believe in him and trust him or whatever. And then he immediately proves that I uh, he really can be trusted to. Um, General Lang, or Lane, excuse me, uh, by saving uh, his daughter, who he puts in harm's way in order to try to take down Superman. So General Lane is making the same mistake that Superman did, where he is, while preaching, uh, don't take advantage of your power, don't let your power corrupt you, we have to set an example, we have to be better than that. He's doing the same thing that he's accusing Superman of doing, where he's not being better than that. And both of them learn this great lesson from this, and both of them come to respect each other more, uh, which is, uh, like, way more, um, you know, sympathetic and, uh, and, uh, compelling than, um, and, and, uh, and sophisticated than Smallville usually was. Uh, so in that way, this is not really like Smallville, uh, but it's like a better version of... It's it's like a much better version of Smallville, at least in those later seasons. And um, so anyway, that was all stuff I appreciated a lot. Uh, let me also talk about the art a little bit, which I'm not as impressed with. Uh, this is very typical digital uh, first art, where it's kind of a rush job in order to get it out every week. Uh, or however often this came out. Um, this is probably not a comment I've ever made about anything, but I think the panel layouts are often like really varied and creative and kind of neat. Uh, really fun dynamic panel layouts with not as great artwork, but vibrant and fun colors too. So like I like the colorization for the most part, and I like the panel work. Uh, but I'm not a big fan of uh, this guy's faces, especially. Um, it's this weird thing where it's kind of cartoony, but he's trying to make the characters look like the actors, so uh, they're, they're like these facial expressions that I recognize almost like they're traced. I don't know if they are traced. I know some artists will do that with uh, stuff that's based on real photography. So you'll have almost photorealistic faces that are, like, simplified and pencil-y and cartoony, and they just end up making for, like... So, th the pictures themselves are not actually photorealistic, but the, the expressions I'll recognize from the show. So, it, cr it creates a lot of really weird-looking facial expressions that just don't go with this art style. Uh, some of the action looks okay, but the, the expressions themselves are, are bad. Uh, much of the time, especially Superman. Um, the Clark Kent and Superman, just really goofy-looking expressions a lot of the time, and a lot of lacking in any backgrounds and detail, uh, which is, uh, again, just kind of cutting corners, it feels like, in order to get it out on time. So, um, not the best artwork, not not a, you know, horrible to look at it or anything, but um, just serviceable, and then sometimes just really goofy in the faces. Um, anyway, I, uh, I like, I like this okay, uh, actually, and I, I think it's, uh, much better plotted and overall better written than, um, most of the last three seasons. I like some stuff in eight, uh, but nine and ten, for the most part, were really rough for me. Uh, it's got pockets, there's bits that I like okay. Uh, this feels like starting over in kind of the way it ought to. It's kind of weird that it's, uh, you know, season 11 going immediately after the last season, because like I said, that just would never have happened. And I might have expected this to be more like Buffy season 11, or season 11, Buffy season 8, where uh, it feels like some time has passed and it's kind of a new show. Uh, this does read like a new show because we're past all the Smallville rules, right? I mean, like, you don't have no flights, no tights anymore. It is a Superman book. Uh, but it also wants to be the very next season of that show. It's taking that literally in a way that some of these uh, season whatever, you know, going after cancellation or ending of a show don't always do. And I'm of two minds about it because you you gotta 
like, like I like how much reinvention is here because it is now a straight up Superman book, and it feels like a, a fun, um, but you know, sometimes silly uh, alternate Superman book. But it's still called Smallville, and we don't really spend a lot of time there. Uh, we do go to Smallville in this arc. I wonder if every arc will come up with some kind of excuse to go to Smallville. Uh, and, and that's where... I, I, I did like this a lot, where uh, there's what looks like an alien ship that, that, that crashes in Smallville. And Chloe's like, where else would it go? Of course it goes to Smallville. So, they, so, so she and uh, her husband now, Oliver Queen, go to Smallville. And they're trying to uh, leave Metropolis. They're trying to move. Uh, but things keep happening that make them feel like they have to stay. And I'm curious to see how long they stay in the book or if they actually leave for a while. Um, and so they go to check out this crash, and it turns out, again, they find Chloe from Earth 2 in the spaceship. And they're, uh, they're, they're kind of uh, making fun of a lot of tropes with aliens showing up, because uh, Chloe's like, not a good track record of, of, of aliens landing uh, in, in, uh, in Smallville or on Earth in general. Uh, you got Clark and you got John Jones and that's about it. Everybody else is like an evil Kryptonian that wants to find and then kill Clark. And as soon as uh, the Earth 2 Chloe wearing, uh, of course, a helmet so you, so you can't see her face so we can do a big reveal of, of that, says, uh, we're, you know, I'm looking for Clark, uh, she's like, everybody's always looking for Clark. This can't be good. And I thought that was really fun. But anyway, so that was an excuse to get us back to Smallville. Um, I guess, of course, the last few, several seasons, really the back half of that show, spent more time in Metropolis than it did in Smallville. And eventually, there was just hardly any reason to go to Smallville and even use those sets anymore. And we were still calling it Smallville. So I guess, by that logic, it's fine that it's still called Smallville, uh, even though we don't spend any time there. And he is already Superman. Um, if you called it something else, it might have been difficult to get fans to even uh, pick it up and realize what it is, and other people might pick it up and be confused by it and be like, why am I reading the Smallville book? I thought this was Superman. I don't know what else you call it, uh, but what, uh, what also makes the title sort of funny is uh, Lois continues, of course, uh, and and uh, the dynamic with uh, with with her and uh, Clark in this is pretty good. I didn't always like them as a couple in that show, but um, in this, the reading is pretty classic. Uh, Clark and Lois, but a Lois that has always known that he's Superman, and I, I like that dynamic. And anyway, so she is like she always did, calling him Smallville, and so now like his name is in the title because like it's Smallville. Because she's always calling him Smallville, and he's also he's also Superman. So I think that's sort of funny. Um, I also like the cliffhanger here a lot, uh, where Superman now, and this also feels like a very uh, Smallville thing to do, except um, way less contrived. That's the thing that, that I think I'm landing on is that uh, this does all of the silly stuff Smallville would do, but not in a contrived way. So uh, at the end of this. Lex has uh, figured out a way to track Superman, and it turns out, this is the big reveal, uh, this is kind of a fun twist, that the whole reason he set up the uh, the thing in space anyway, because the, the, the whole, uh, I didn't even talk about this, but the name Guardian is like a uh, orbital platform thing that he puts up uh, in order to try to create uh, security in case there's alien threats. And he uh, forces that to happen really fast under the pretense of we can't trust Superman. And he really doesn't trust Superman, of course. Uh, and But the uh, real reason he does it is in order to irradiate Superman so that he can now track him. So Clark can't be Clark anymore because uh, if he goes home, Lex knows that he's Superman. So right away, it's very difficult to keep that secret from him. And uh, I, I like that. I, I, I think that's uh, kind of a compelling conflict and an exciting thing to do moving forward and see how he ends up getting out of it and all of that. But anyway, so uh, somehow or rather I have managed to make this video the exact length of an episode of Smallville. So I'm going to stop now. And uh, thanks a bunch to Ian for requesting this. And I, you know, I almost read a couple arcs to talk about. And I'm glad I didn't do that because I would have been talking a lot longer probably. Uh, but I had to talk about the basic setup of this book and what it is and everything. So um, I don't 
want to promise that the next one will be shorter, but I'm glad that I didn't do more than one arc. So anyway, uh, I will be back in the not-too-distant future for another one of these, uh, and I, because I want to keep reading this book, I'm very intrigued by it now and liking it a lot better, even than the last time I read this arc. So um, I, I'm excited to talk about it, and excited to talk more Smallville with you guys, because uh, I miss doing Counting Crypt the Freaks. Uh, like I said, I'm hoping to bring that back in uh, series overview form at some point in the future. And in, in the meantime, uh, I will chat a little bit about these um, here and there. And uh, if I get back to the season overviews, don't worry, I will eventually do season 11 also that way, less scatterbrained and half-baked. Uh, but yeah, I don't mean half-baked as in I've been doing, uh, you know, any substances or anything. Just half-baked in, you know, I'm jumping all over the place. I'm jumping all over the place. Uh, Batman, next time, in a few weeks. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again then. I'm Captain Logan, and uh, happy reading, guys.